Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, my goal is to try to get us back on schedule. So there's a clock on the wall at, uh, at we're, supposed to, we're supposed to finish at 11.50, but I'm going to keep you for five extra minutes. So at 11.55, we will stop at wherever we are. So because otherwise no one gets lunch. Like, like I hope the food court's on the right. Sorry, food court's on the So I'm David Ng, um, and what I'm going to do is... Um, uh, you have in front of you the paper, and then I was going to do slides, and I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to do slides. Uh, I'm actually going to step through the paper, and, uh, and I'll have a discussion. And a lot of this has to do with um, trying to bring the idea of systems, you know, systems thinking, whatever you want to call it, together with the pattern language. But what I've discovered over a long period of time is that there's actually a long history of ideas that have already been there, both in Christopher Alexander's writing and other people's writing. And if you don't know about it, then it's kind of like, oh, I didn't know that. And so I'm trying to piece all these things together and put you on a, a common foundation so that we look at the content and all get it together. So it's available on uh, my website, acolabaldwin.com. You can find that. It's OK, people come in there. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to step through. Uh, this paper. So what, what does I want to do? Um, and it re actually relates to the talk we've already had. The stay open. Then I will... Thank you. Okay. So the question that I'm asking and what I think we should be working towards is, does a pattern language generate into a whole? Um, and we're talking about architecting a system. And so, um, I do a lot of background research, and that includes going to Berkeley uh, and going to the library where the original pattern manual was, and I went in and photocopied it, or uh, uh, copied of it. And uh, I just happened to find this before, uh, before uh, I would start to work on the uh, paper. So it says, the environmental pattern language will contain hundreds of subsystems and tens of thousands of individual patterns. Okay, so the idea that the pattern language has subsystems was written in 1967. Okay, so there's a connection between patterns and systems. Actually, it doesn't say systems. It's good here, it says subsystems, but um, we have this idea, but it's hundreds of subsystems, tens of thousands of individual patterns. So that should tell you that a pattern is smaller than a subsystem. Right? That makes some sense, right? Okay, well, then that's progress, because that means that we're actually making some linkage between systems and patterns. If you agree that a system is larger than a subsystem, which I don't think anyone would disagree with, then we're kind of on our way. So I'm focused very much on system design, and, and uh, if we start referring to something, and that's why I referred, um, maybe this was a comment you heard yesterday about Notes on, a, notes on the synthesis of form. So systems thinking fundamentally is the idea of synthesis and analysis. Synthesis is putting things together. Analysis is taking things apart. Russ Acoff defines authentic system thinking as synthesis before analysis. And when you do that, you're trying to look for things in the containing whole. And so you're looking for, um, if you're trying to redesign a transit system, you can go down inside the transit system and look at streetcars and bus halls and stuff, but maybe you should go up into the city. If you want to understand how the transit city system works, you don't necessarily go down into the analysis, you go into the synthesis upwards and say, this is how it fits into the city, and that's how you understand it. So that's a brief definition of it. And so um, what I'm going to do is, is step through some ideas and make sure everyone's on the same framing. And so, um, one of the questions is, for whom and in which situations are subsystems generated through pattern language? So who's actually doing this generation? Is it supposed to be the builder? Is it supposed to be the person living in the house? Is it the person that's living in the city? Those types of questions we ask. So the, uh, I've got six frames here that I want to um, enlighten you on. So maybe you know these, maybe you don't know them, but I want to make sure they're kind of all on the same uh, same page here. So uh, here we are, 1.1, form and synthesis. And so he goes back to Darcy Thompson, the diagram of forces, and this is in 1964. Um, 
The challenge is then in the context of a design problem and problem solving in context of problem seeking. So before this, so this is kind of when I was looking back, well, what is Christopher Alexander trying to do? And what was, the, what was happening in architecture in that period? In 1969, this idea came out of problem seeking. And you differentiate between problem seeking and problem solving. And so since I'm not an architect, I'll make jokes about the architects who want to build that thing. They want to build the building on the side of a mountain because it's the most difficult thing they could do. They're doing problem seeking, not problem solving. Now, a lot of the stuff I see in pattern language is oriented, and the way that we frame it, if you take the classic idea of problem, of that a pattern is a solution to a problem in context. Okay, well, in systems, we often talk about picking the problems. Um, and uh, a lot of work has been done on, uh, on problem determination or um, uh, problem generation, those sorts of things. And so, in that sense, we can look at this, at this sort of history where we've got the idea of, of that coming in. At the same time, we've got the idea of coming into form. Um, and this is one of the challenges I have with system thinking. And um, so I've, I've given everyone um, bookmarks. But besides that, I've also given you a postcard with my book on it. I don't recommend this book. Colleen actually is now downloaded. It's actually free. There's no cost for this thing. There is actually pattern language in this dissertation. This is actually a dissertation that um, I have to reduce. Uh, but the pattern language is in there for innovation. Um, and, and so do you think that a pa innovation has a form? And so kind of like, well, no. Now we're starting to question the, the foundations on which we're doing stuff. And so I work in social systems. I work in service systems specifically. How do you design a business service or a government service? And there are form elements associated with that, but now we're back in 1964, and we're at the foundation of Christopher Alexander's work, and it's kind of like, okay, so there is pattern language within building architecture, um, and, and, and then you have form and physical space and stuff like that, but not everyone works that way. So I got into this argument yesterday with David Seaman, and he's saying, of course there's always form. I said, you need to understand my career. I worked 28 years at IBM. After six years, they took away my office. So everyone here, equal distance, whether I'm in Toronto, it doesn't matter whether I'm here or not. The way the corporation works is everyone is virtual. So when you're talking about physical space, and he agreed you know, at that point, maybe you know, me talking about physical space doesn't make sense. So I think we need to take, take that challenge and take that question, are we actually working with physical space? But this is at the foundation. OK, uh, the organization is semi lattices. We have the city is not a tree. Um, and then we have all arranged in sets. Uh, we see this sort of uh, formation in, um, uh, in the Federated Wiki stuff that we're working on. And so uh, yesterday when Ward Cunningham um, thanks Ward for, for <laughs> citing me as in 2015-2016, I was bugging him because you could not see the semi-lattice. All you have are these pages, and it's like, I can't navigate. And so um, the other paper I have... which was the plot paper that I did, um, we go back to the multi-service centers book. And so this is 1968. You can take, I'll give you copies of these papers you want. Like, he drew it. And so we're doing federated wiki, and it's like, well, I can't see it. So that's why I was working on Ward, and at first says, oh, you want to do this? It's like, no, no. So, so I'm still working on him, because in this, um, so this is mathematically a graph, and what I, Ward hasn't implemented yet is labeling the lines. You want to label the edges as well as the nodes, because there are properties in the edges, and when we're working on systems, I don't want to know that just that this is related to that. I want to know that this is inside that. So if we take the streetcar that runs, our tram system runs, I want to know that's in the city, and I want to label the arc between them. So that's the sort of stuff that comes out with these ideas of trees and seven lattices. Um, system generating systems. If you actually search on system generating systems, uh, Alexander, you'll end up on my blog because I unearthed this stuff. And um, this leans a lot on the work of uh, Molly Steenson, who's at Carnegie Mellon now. Um, and, uh, and so there are two ideas in the word system the idea system as a whole, the idea generating system. 
Uh, we've got the usual idea of systems, but then he talks about this idea of generating systems. Now, the problem is that we get into the discussion about kit of parts. And when people think about that, when you assemble in the physical world, it kind of makes sense to do that. But when we talk about systems, I've actually changed the way I've been teaching systems recently because people tend to think about, uh, so Russ Acoff usually gives the analogy of, oh, we have an automobile, you have the carburetor in the automobile, the relationship is a function that uh, the carburetor gives to the automobile. And I'm, I'm now changing the metaphor and because we talk about uh, the body, a human body, and we talk about medicine, Chinese medicine, okay, there is the kidney organ in my system, but there, there is a kidney subsystem in Chinese medicine. So it turns out that I was born with eczema and allergies because I have a weak kidney system within my body. That's a different way of looking, so that's, that's when you start getting the systems and subsystems. It's not about my kidney organ, it's about my kidney system. So when we talk about this idea of kit of parts, it's not mechanical in the, in the general sense. And so I wish that uh, Alexander had spent more time talking to Western. Uh, that, that's kind of what I get out of the, this. I have a smile because he was a perky at that time. <laughs> so um, we have the idea of generative patterns and non-generative patterns. And uh, the one of the top, top 10 books in computer science is, um, is the uh, software um, design patterns, um, elements of object-oriented software. Um, and the history I got from this, according to the POP conference, uh, Ralph Johnson is one of the co-authors, is that that book was written without reference to Christopher Alexander. It was accidental. So the person that was working with Christopher Alexander was Richard Gabriel, who was one of the co-founders of the Hillside Group. The people in computer science were creating a pattern catalog. It is not a real pattern language in the sense that they've done it. And so if you look back in the archives, you have Copelian. Uh, now, Copelian, Jim Copley is an interesting guy. He's a, he's a brilliant guy. He is also the uh, chief methodologist for the, for the Scrum Alliance. And so if people are doing Scrum in software development, and they're using the methods, then Jim is driving that because he actually understands these type of systems and how they, how they fit together. Uh, but the, uh, the idea that we have, and, and this is actually Copley and Say, is we have what are called gamma patterns. This shows up in the, in the uh, original wiki that they've done. And he says that these are not generative patterns. So all the software people, when they're working on them, in essence, are not building generative patterns. They don't generate anything. So software people aren't very helpful, but that's part of the background. Okay, so now we get into uh, system A and system B, um, and um, for those of you who have not yet caught up on this probably yet, I want to read. My practical recommendation for anyone that is going to read Christopher Alexander, do not start at the beginning. You start with the last book. You start with uh, the battle for life and beauty on the earth, because to me, it is the complete work where it's not just the ideas, but the implementation as well. And so uh, I've given a previous talk on this, and one of the things that, that um, I, I really liked in that book was the idea of patterns in the land and patterns in the buildings. And what you're doing is moving two systems together like this, and it's kind of like, okay, that's what he says in the book. Can you find that anywhere else, like in Nature of Order? Like, it doesn't come up like that. So. If you actually look at that book, that is what I've done. Uh, and I've, I have the previous talks. Uh, those are recorded. I have them on video if you want to go through them. But, and the papers are there. But the idea essentially is that we can look at different ways of building. Um, and, there, um, and there's two different approaches. Okay. So, um, the last one uh, that I want to fill you in on. Uh, so I've been doing systems for since 1998, and it's only within the last couple of years, actually within the last year, I've made the switch towards holons. And this comes from the work of Timothy Al uh, Timothy F. H. Allen, uh, University of Madison, Wisconsin. And, um, and so uh, holons, it turns out, goes through all the stuff in the Resilience Alliance. And essentially the idea, and it started with Kessler, but Kessler didn't develop it. There's actually a really interesting book called Redu Beyond Reductionism where um, 
it's, it's a meeting that Kessler hosted. Kessler was a science writer, and he hosted um, Smithies, von Bertalanffy, Piaget, in this one meeting in Alsbeck, uh, in um, Austria, I think. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's um, an interesting book because you've got uh, von Bertalanffy there, who's one of the people that's at the foundation of general systems theory. And they've taken that, those ideas and they've actually embedded them into um, a lot of the deeper ideas on systems. Um, but fundamentally, the, the difference when you look at a holon is that a holon, in, um, Kessler called it uh, Janus. So it is the uh, Greek god that has two faces. And so you're always looking both at larger systems and at smaller systems. And so when we actually, when people talk about systems, Again, they're not thinking about the way that systems fit together because what I'm interested in is how they nest together. So I'm interested in how the tram fits in the city. And I, and I can also be interested in how the tram operates, you know, take it apart. That's two different views. But just looking at saying the tram is a system, it's kind of like, well, it's in the context of something larger and, and the smaller parts associated with it. So that comes out of the whole lot of stuff. And that's um, stuff that I am looking into now. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Um, now, the question would, uh, second question, which I like sense making, in systems architecture and systems design, why would, uh, or which values would be afforded by the development of uh, pattern languages? Um, so, uh, I have been um, in the uh, Open Innovation Learning Book, uh, when I was finishing, in fact, my dissertation, I wrote the whole thing and then I threw away chapter 9 and rewrote it because I fell into um, Tim Ingold, who's an ecological anthropologist. Uh, and this was, uh, this was part of the argument I had with David Seaman yesterday. He says, oh, I had a huge fight with Tim Ingold. I go, yeah, well, different, different approach. Um, the uh, ecological epistemology, the reason I've, I've been attracted to it, is Tim Ingold, for those who are into um, systems theory and reading Gregory Bateson, I never understood Gregory Bateson really until I started reading Tim Ingold, and Tim Ingold combines Gregory Bateson with J.J. Gibson, who coined the term affordance. So the idea of an affordance that they normally say is an affordance is like a door, a doorknob is an affordance. So you can't open a door, you can't, you can't pull on a door unless there's a doorknob on it, right? But if you actually look at the original definition that Gibson has, uh, Gibson says if you don't recognize it as a doorknob, it's not an affordance. This went into computer science, so Don, uh, Don Norman is the, the chief designer of the Mac interface, the one that put, that put the trash can in the interface. So the trash can affords you the ability to get rid of a document. However, if you were like the first time Mac users, everyone was, how do I delete something off my desktop? I can't delete it. The trash can is not an affordance because you don't recognize it. So this is the stuff that Tim Ingold has done, and Tim Ingold has also Changing is changing the way that I'm looking at systems because uh, most people talk about systems. So we talk about I was just talking about um, the kidney system in my body, and we're thinking about it. We tend to think of it cross sectionally. We don't think about it in time. And Tim Ingold has this idea of uh, what he calls lines or threads. The lines or threads run through time. And so when we're thinking about my kidney system, we should actually be thinking about it in time, not so much in space. So we have um, a few topics here, types of systems and models. Uh, this is from Russell A. Koff. Uh, and so we should make a, this is a helpful um, differentiation for those people who are teleological, goal-oriented, uh, because we work across different types of systems. So uh, the way that A. Koff describes this, a deterministic system is not purposeful. A machine doesn't choose to be a machine. The engine doesn't choose to be an engine. Uh, an animated system. Uh, your, your heart doesn't choose to be a heart, but we as animated beings actually can choose what we do. We have human will. Social systems, we as individuals have choice. We as a group have a choice. And then as ecology, we can influence parts of the ecology, so you may be able to influence one lake, but try to influence the whole world pretty tough. So that's, that's part of the foundational stuff that happens within... Uh, within uh, system theory. Um, 
Also in writing my book, uh, so uh, Helene will be familiar with the concept or heard the term autopoiesis a lot. Uh, I actually started looking into autopoiesis and what it actually meant, and there's a book by Schumacher, an architect on autopoiesis and architecture, uh, and he explained this pretty well in the sense of uh, auto, there's autopoiesis and there's allopoiesis, and it's been borrowed from, um, autopoiesis was originally uh, developed by Macharana and Varela uh, in describing biology, the people in knowledge management pick this up and go, oh, self-reproducing knowledge. And Maturana goes, no, 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 I'm a biologist. This has nothing to do with knowledge management. So everyone that does knowledge management and say that they want autopoetic organization that learns all the sort of stuff, it's like, that's not happening. All of that is kind of garbage. That's people making up things. That's not real science. Now, the difference between autopoiesis, which is self-reproduction, uh, there is, there's another class called allopoiesis, which is producing stuff that's different. So in your body, your cell is autopoietic because it produces another cell. Your body produces another cell, so we continue over time. But allopoiesis is usually designed as a factory. So you have a, a production line. The produ so you have parts going into a car. The car doesn't reproduce itself, right? The factory line is a machine that creates something that's different. So we make the distinction between autopoiesis and allopoiesis. And we get into generative, this gets to be important, because then we're discussing generative or regenerative. Regenerative would tend to suggest uh, allopo um, autopoetic, but now we have to debate about whether everything is autopoetic and stuff like that, so that's a longer discussion. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, economies, agricultural, industrial, and services. And this is one of the big suppositions I have. Uh, and the, I'll make the note here that um, uh, over the past 10, 15 years, I've been working with uh, Jim Spohr and IBM Research. Uh, essentially, IBM um, said that uh, came to universities and said the students you're graduating don't have the skills that we want as a corporation. Now, Jim Spohr was behind that, and we had the vice president of presidents 10 years ago saying that, and he created this new field called service science. And you go, what's service science? And he said, I actually don't know. But this happened 10 years ago. Uh, or it happened, and it was written on IEEE software. There used to be this field where IBM went out and said, "We don't have you, that, I, that the university is not graduating the students we want." Um, and people would say, "Well, what is it, IBM?" And said, "We don't know." And the math department says, "We do that, IBM." The engineer said, "We do that." You know, all these people say, and, and eventually it became called computer science. So there is a science of services that's coming. And the difference is that when we're talking about things like the production of houses, that's a production orientation towards the way we look at systems. But today, if you have, uh, production is really important when demand exceeds supply. When you don't have enough food in the world, production is really important. When you have so much food in the world that we're throwing it away, now you're talking about services because it's a pull, it's not a push. And so we have to not only look at, a thing, at things from a production perspective, we need to look at them from a services perspective. And a lot of things in the world have moved to services. So we can talk, uh, the usual uh, analogy we talk about is buses versus taxi cabs. A bus is a production system. The bus runs the same route whether anybody is on the bus or not. That's the way the system is designed. If you get in a taxi cab, it is a service system, a taxi cab, requires you to set the passenger at least to tell the driver, where am I going? Where do you want me to go? Okay. So um, that's kind of it. Uh, we are now, I'm, what we're going to do, I will have one minute, so I'm going to close. I'm going to invite anyone that wants to have more discussion. Um, I'm around until Monday morning, so I'm here to do you know, conference tomorrow. We can discuss offline. Um, and if you want to go for lunch, then we can have discussions about any of these ideas. Wish we had more time. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.